when I was with third bat, I was on, you know, a, a particular mission, you know, you, I've told you about it, the ambush in Iraq, you know, yeah, go, um, go for it. Tell me about it. And, yeah, um, but I'll, I'll talk about it, but the, the, where I was going with it initially was, you know, like there were, you know, like two or three silver stars in one day, 10 or 12 purple hearts off of in that same day. 10 or 12 bronze stars with valor, myself included in that one day. Yeah. That was such an intense day of firefighting where still a lot of us stay in touch who may not have had a lot of other career experience together otherwise, right. but we all have that one day in common. And that one day was so formidable for all of us. Um, and we equally shared it that we stay in touch with each other years later, you yeah. know? For sure. Um, you, you know, at one point, um, and I, 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 I'll go through it quickly, but then talk about the importance of it. Um, what we did that day with Third Bat in Western Iraq um, was the Marines. We were in uh, Shark Base in Ramadi, and it was uh, the summer of 2005, and that was basically the place to be. Mm -hmm. And the Joint Task Force was running. Um, high value targets and um, any missions that were not um, tier one targets, we would then turn over to the vanilla seals who were on the other side of shark base at the time. Uh, and they task force bruiser and they would go out and execute them. Okay. And that's not to discount anything that they did in that same period of time, because they were doing very important work as well. Oh, for sure. But the majority of it was missions that the task force, frankly, wouldn't launch on. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the, at, at that time, the Marines were going on a uh, clearance operation through a portion of Ramadi that had not been patrolled in months. And it was well known that a lot of bad guys had repopulated that area because Fallujah had just uh, the battle of Fallujah had just uh, uh, come to a close, which was a major event. Yeah. Uh, and Ramadi was becoming a, a, a beehive of bad guys. And so yeah, it was that's a too long deal. to leave a place like that. Uh, yeah. You, can, you can't leave it ungoverned. You right. know? And so what we had coordinated was that uh, the JTF was going to uh, set up a blocking position on the other side of the clearance operation where there was a river with a single bridge going over it because the, the assumption was if there's any bad guys in town that are leaving during the clearance operation, the only way out of town, if they don't want to come in contact with the Marines, is to go over that bridge. That's the only way out. And so we took a company of rangers out there the joint task force we had other attachments with us as well and we set up the day prior okay we walked you know we went in by helicopters walked for like an entire period of darkness and set up and uh sure thing the plan was a success and almost immediately as soon as they began we we had set up a blocking position on the bridge with interpreters I love um, the story. And, and it was a perfect, the, the road was a perfect dog leg going down to the bridge and, yeah. and, and the uh, road was built up. And so it was elevated uh, with ditches on both sides and on the uh -huh. other side of the ditches, which were also elevated of equal height to the uh, road was all cornfields. Okay. Okay. And so you could very easily, which we did, hide in the cornfields, which were a couple meters away from the road. And you had no idea driving on the road. You just thought it was ditches on the side. Right. And so we had a block, we had a sawhorse with a sign on it that said, you know, this road is temporarily closed. <laughs> and uh, the first car of the day pulled up. And so we sent an interpreter out and we sent a couple of uh, task force guys out. And as soon as they went onto the road, this car immediately open fire at the, uh, got our guys unknown to them that there was an, you know, 45 Rangers in the cornfield <laughs> yeah. who all with, without exception, simultaneously shot this car. Okay. So imagine what an entire, you know, 
a, a, a company minus of Ranger firepower simultaneously firing into a single car a few meters away looks and sounds like, right? Uh, needless to say, every, every, all the entire threat was eliminated immediately. Um, but what we realized when we went up to SSE this, um, and you know, you've heard this part of the story before, um, you know, these, as, as we were pulling the, um, combatants out of the vehicle, uh, one of their cell phones started ringing and the interpreter at the time, it was a guy from Cal grew up in Iraq and then moved to California, spoke perfect, um, spoke the language perfectly. He, he held the phone up to the commander at the time. I still talked to that commander, by the way, and said, kind of jokingly, do you want to answer this? And he said, yes, I want you to answer that. See who's on the other line. And so he did. And they had a very, you know, how those guys communicate. They're, you know, yelling and having an exciting conversation. And, and when he hung up, he said, what, so what was that all about? And he said, this guy, these guys apparently know each other and they're all bad guys. And he said, what happened? What? I just heard a bunch of shooting. Tell me what's going on. And I told him, yeah, I was leaving the city and I encountered a bunch of Marines down by the river. But don't worry, I shot them all and we're stopped down by the bridge right now. What should we do? And that guy said, stay there. I'm going to send more fighters to your position so that you can keep fighting the Marines. Okay. Stay by the bridge. Um, there's, I'm going to send another car with four guys down. And we said, okay. Now, years later, I, I thought about this, by the way, this is basically a, a legacy feint. Okay. From a, yeah. from a, from a doctrinal war fighting perspective, this is, this is a classic feint uh, with modern technology. We were using right. cell phones. Um, and so, you know, I had uh, attack aviation and F-18s uh, overhead at the time. And I'm on a couple meters away from this road and I'm sharing all this with them. I'm like, uh, we're trying to get this car off the road because we got intel that there's going to be another car coming down. So start <laughs> scanning this road and let me know if anybody's coming down the road. And they started doing it. And you know, Rangers went up and pushed this car off the road into a ditch so you couldn't see it when you were driving down the road. And this is all in a short period of time. And then I have aircraft telling us, yes, we have a sedan coming down this dirt road at a high rate of speed. And we there are things sticking out of every window. and We think that they're weapons. And we're like, oh, man, this is unbelievable. This cannot this is this can't be happening. So. You know, everybody is told, hey, get into your fighting positions. Uh, this is going to be a hasty ambush. As soon as this vehicle stops at that sign, if we identify vehicles, that's the trigger. And um, and so they did. They pulled up. It was a sedan. These guys had rifles sticking out of every window. And as soon as they stopped at that sign, we immediately engaged, myself included, that vehicle. What was remarkable I don't know how this happened. Still, four guys. Imagine 45 people shooting at a vehicle three meters away from them. These guys did like an Austin Powers 27-point turn on this road, <laughs> turned the car around, and drove the opposite direction. Okay? They were probably... How? How, how was... If you forget about the road, them being alive, how was the car even operational, you know? I, yes, I know. Listen, because the road was on ditches, they couldn't just make a U-turn. They were like doing these little curves <laughs> to keep it from going off the road. Okay. And so this oh. car starts going in the other direction and we're like, this is unbelievable. We cannot let this car get away from us. Right. So, you know, again, it's just like unbelievable events the entire day. So a uh, Gustav team, the commander says, Hey, goose the car. So a Gustav team runs out into the road this car is getting as fast as he can drive away. The gunner sits Indian style on the road, gets the goose off on his shoulder. The guy loads it and gives him, you know, taps him to shoot. He shoots the first round. It goes right over the top of this, oh. uh, barely a miss. And as they're reloading, one of the guys in the car has just got his AK out of the window backwards, just spraying. 
Right. He rips around right into the groin of the goose gunner who's no sitting in way. the pile, hits him right in the groin. Now he's laid out on the road. Okay. Oh. Uh, never didn't get a second round off. And almost immediately the car at that point, I think all these guys were hit multiple times. Yeah. At yeah. that point, it went off the road. The car went off the road into a ditch. Okay. So now we've got a casualty. Um, and the problem with that was now we got a car in a ditch and, um, two of those guys got out of the car and we're now in the cornfields. Okay. So now you've got unaccounted personnel who are walking around. Sure. Um, and so they sent Ranger teams out online stepping one foot at a time through these cornfields looking for these guys. Okay. Um, and the remarkable thing is one of the, one of those guys is still in the army. Now he's a CSM. His name is Kirk. This was his first of two silver stars, by the way, an absolute war fighter. Um, he and his team were walking one step at a time and they came up on one of those guys who had gotten out of the car. Okay. And that guy was basically, you know, on his way out. But when he saw them, he stood up pulled a hand grenade and ran towards them. And Kirk grabbed the dude and took him to the ground and took the grenade in the chest. Oh my God. Um, And so everybody hears this grenade go off and we're like, what is going on? And it's some, you know, private on the, back then privates didn't have radios. Right. It's a private on his team leader radio. And he's like, "Uh, Sergeant so-and-so just jumped on a hand grenade what should we do now? We're like, <laughs> is he alive? We're like, yeah, he's alive. He's having a hard time hearing. We're like, bring him to the medic. That's what you should do. It, yes. Eliminate the threat and bring him to the medic. And to, so, to clarify, he had body armor on, obviously. Yeah, body armor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The other, the, the, uh, the, the enemy combatant did not survive that, obviously. Obviously. Okay? Yeah. Now, this is such a ranger mentality. Oh. Okay. I'm with the CP. And I got the medic next to me. I got the the um, RTO next to me, the commander, the FSO. And we're sitting there and we had just all finished shooting this car too. So we're all hyped up and reloading magazines. And in, in comes this guy who just took a hand grenade in the chest and he's a little, you know, shocked. And he's having a hard time hearing. And uh, the commander right away to the medic, he's like, Take all, take everything off, and make sure that he's okay. And the medic is looking over him, and he's he's like, "Lay down, lay down." And he's talking loud because he's he can't hear well. Right. And uh, the medic gets his seer, scissors out. We're wearing ACUs at the time, uh-huh. and he goes to cut his uniform off just to check him. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, "No, no, 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 no! Don't cut my cut my uniform." Why? What are you talking about? I need to check you to make sure you're not you don't have any injuries from that hand grenade. He goes. You can't cut it. The the deployment packing list said bring <laughs> the deployment packing list said bring three uniforms and I only brought two and the other one is in laundry. If you cut <laughs> this one off of me, I won't have another uniform and I'll get in trouble. That's so Ranger, man. And he's saying it so loud because he just his eardrums are basically blowing out. Right. And he's like, I think. I think you're going to be okay, man. You just jumped on a hand grenade. Okay. <laughs> we'll get you some more. He's got like shrapnel in his throat. Oh from my God. Jumping on a hand grenade. He's worried about the fact that he doesn't have all the items on the packing list. Like that's like, it's just not, it wasn't a big thing to him. Yeah. He yeah. He couldn't appreciate what he had just done, you know? Right. And, and at the same time, by the way, you know, the next vehicle that came in, we, we shot up and we, we had to get that uh, vehicle off the same road because cars kept coming all yeah. day. Bad guys, cars full of bad guys kept coming. From but the phone, to, right? The, the ter- yeah, they through the phone. Back, the turbo was, called to talk to yes, them. Yes, and every yeah. time the guy would call and he'd say, what's going on? And, you know, for, for, for multiple cars in a row, the interpreter we had was like, things are going great. We're all, we're, <laughs> everybody's <laughs> linking up. Okay, at one point, you know, let me let me um, back up for just a minute. The next car that came in after we had shot it up, we had to get the car off the road because got people wouldn't come all the way into the kill zone if they saw another car sitting there shot up. Sure. Um, and and the next car, although everyone had been 
sufficiently engaged, uh, the driver was still squirming. Okay. He was basically at that point, it was just nerves moving his yeah. body, but, um, the, the commander to, you know, is his risk to buy. He said, I don't want anyone up there pushing that car. Cause there was a very real VVIED threat in that part of Iraq at the time. Sure. He said, I don't want anybody pushing that car until everyone and all the occupants stop moving. Okay. Because if there's a switch in that car that could be hit, I, I can't allow anyone to go up there if there's yeah, a chance sure. that, that guy could hit it. Right. It's, a, yeah, it's for sure. reasonable. Yeah. And so we went back and forth and we, you know, at the same time, we got guys jumping on hand grenades. We got guys getting shot in the groin. Like there's a lot going on. Right. And the platoon sergeant at the time, Colin, you know, who was like a burden of ship kind of guy then and even now, you know, he's at going back and forth at some Colin point. Colin B. Yeah, Colin B. Yeah. He's, you know, to the company commander, he's like, all right, sir, we've talked about this enough. And he just walked out of the cornfield, walked through the ditch, walked right up to the window and put a magazine into this guy sitting in the driver's seat, reloaded, pulled the guy out onto the ground and said, Sir, there's no moving occupants in the vehicle. Give me a squad to push this vehicle off the road now. And <laughs> off it went. That sounds, you know, that sounds got like silver, him. He got a silver star for that as well. And so, oh, really? You know, this, you know, things calmed down for a few minutes um, after all of that. Now we got a guy who had just been shot in the groin. He was bleeding out pretty good. He's sucking on a fentanyl lollipop. They're, you know, doing significant. Um, casualty care to him. We brought in um, um, uh, medevac for him and, and we carried himself, myself included, carried him on a stretcher out to that helicopter and got him out of there. Um, and, you know, by the time all of that settled down, the intel kept coming, the phone kept ringing, right? Like the, the narrative kept getting better. And then, you know, where I finally, besides, you know, shooting my own, my gun, what every JTAC, ETAC that really wants to do is drop. Sure. Um, the phone kept ringing. And the, the Terp at that point had convinced this guy who was basically in charge of all the bad guys there, you know, the local uh, team leader, that we had, what he had told him was we had captured a Marine at that point. And oh said, we have continued to battle the Marines down by the river. And at this point, we had captured one. Okay. Who in is reality, this who can, has this great imagination? You know? I know. In, <laughs> in reality, um, what it, it was us ambushing these cars all day. Okay. Yeah. And, and we were taking casualties. They were taking casualties. We were medevacking guys out. We were jumping on hand grenades. But he had convinced him that the whole time, the bad guys were winning and we captured a Marine. So he said, listen, um, I, it, it was a couple of phone calls back and forth. He said, I'm going to send a camera crew down to the river and I want you to cut that Marine's head off oh and we're going to get it on video. Um, I'm going to put the camera crew in the back of an ambulance and I'm going to tell them, turn the lights on so they can get through the city while the Marines are clearing it. Okay. But when the ambulance gets to your position, you'll know it's the camera crew in the back um, and you know what to do when they get there. Right. And so I share this with all the aircraft in the stack. I said, hey, continue scanning the, the um, route into our position. But we have intel that there could potentially be an ambulance with its lights on headed our way. And if we do, uh, the commander has declared it. Um, hostile and sure thing it was it was a uh, marine um uh ah1 uh1 combo nice. and they said no it, this was all during the day by the way they said no shit. with our naked eye we can see an ambulance with its lights on <laughs> headed down the dirt road directly to your position and we're like all right let's 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 hit it so uh, what we ended up doing was coordinating a hellfire strike on it. And before it even made it to our position, they came in with a low altitude hellfire strike. Perfect. Um, I saw the video afterwards and, and it came right in the back doors of the ambulance and just split this thing in half. <laughs> and um, at that point, the cat was out of the bag on what had really been going on all yeah, day. Yeah. And uh, we, I can't believe uh, it went on for that long. I mean, that's, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, I'm talking like, 
you, you know, if we had just been sitting there all day, we would have had a better plan on how to take care of ourselves. But because it was basically an all day gunfight, nobody took the time to think about things like, are we drinking water? Are right. we putting sunscreen on? Are we eating? Nobody was doing that. But by, by like sunset, when things were finally settling down emotionally and physically, as we were talking about before, everybody was like absolutely spent and yeah. everybody was, I, I have pictures that a couple of pictures were snapped on that day that I have. Um, and I look back and I'm, we were all incredibly bright red sunburn oh, because we were out in, in Western Iraq all day in the summertime, <laughs> super dehydrated. Our lips are all chapped because nobody was drinking water all day. Um, and you know, it just was like this series of events where the only thing on your mind was killing bad guys. Hey!